Will you learn who lives in the stratosphere? Who are the elves and sprites? Why do lightning strikes in space? Where can't planes and space stations fly? Where is the meteor graveyard? And understand why the temperature at 100 kilometers is colder than at 500 kilometers? What is really happening to the ozone layer? How did the new space race begin? Why do weather forecasts always lie? And why has no astronaut ever left Earth? Many people believe that space is far away. The generally accepted boundary separating Earth from space is the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers high. However, instead of getting hung up on official boundaries, let's consider the physical realities. At an altitude of 10 kilometers, the atmosphere can be just as dangerous as space, and even a minor error can be fatal. Ever heard of the Phantom Plane? Helios Flight 522, during a flight at an altitude of 10 kilometers, it stopped responding to the dispatcher. To check what happened, fighter jets were sent there, and in the portholes they found the passengers motionless. In the cockpit, there was a steward attempting to rectify the situation while the airliner ran out of fuel and eventually crashed a few minutes later. What caused this tragedy? The little handle was in the wrong position, causing all of the air to escape unnoticed from the plane, and there was not enough oxygen on board for the passengers to breathe. The result was a plane full of deceased individuals on autopilot. Yes, on the one hand, this story sounds scary, but on the other hand, this altitude beckons hundreds of people. As we ascend to 10 kilometers, we leave behind what we typically consider weather phenomena, such as rain, cyclones, thunderstorms, tornadoes, ordinary clouds, and particularly winds. And if we go even higher, up to 30 kilometers, we're down to 99% of all the air mass. You can observe a thin blue line on the horizon that we once believed was the source of our life. However, the mass of air up there has a significant impact on us. Indeed, it may seem that nothing interesting happens as we continue to climb upward. However, this is not the case. The higher we climb, the more thrilling the experience becomes. And the best part is that you can experience it all with me from the comfort of your couch or chair. It doesn't matter where you are. In this publication, we've compiled more than 80 facts about our planet's atmosphere and combined them into a fascinating story. It's no secret that many of us dislike weather forecasts. They often seem as unreliable as horoscopes. Weather forecasting involves the use of a computer model that calculates the probability of various weather conditions. The accuracy of the forecast can fluctuate depending on how far into the future we are trying to predict. Generally speaking, the farther into the future, the less accurate the forecast becomes. Nevertheless, daily weather forecasts tend to be relatively accurate. 95 success for temperature and 80 success for precipitation. The accuracy of weather forecasts tends to decrease 3% per day. This is because the computer model used to make the forecast includes hundreds of parameters from various sources, including land, water, and air. Even the slightest change in one of these parameters can cause a chain reaction of change in the entire region, like a domino effect. Over time, the accumulation of these changes can make the forecast less accurate. So don't blame forecasters for incorrect weather forecasts. Weather forecasting is a complex process involving the use of electronic machines, which can be the size of a room, to calculate weather conditions for the entire planet. Although this is a complex task, it can be explained relatively simply. What kind of fuel does a weather machine run on? Of course, it's solar, but the air doesn't get it directly from the sun. Instead, the sun sends energy in the form of short waves of light which the Earth absorbs and then reflects back as long infrared waves or heat. The uneven distribution of sunlight on our planet causes the weather to work through the movement of air masses, which bring us wind and precipitation. However, to correct this imbalance, a machine called atmospheric circulation is activated. This machine consists of three large gears in each hemisphere, known as atmospheric cells, which help distribute heat to all latitudes. Each of these gears is enormous and outweighs the mass of air by significant distances. In areas where there is an increase in mass, an area of low pressure is created as the air naturally moves and puts less pressure on your head. It is here that moist air rises and causes precipitation. This explains the humid climate of countries like Thailand and Brazil, where jungles thrive. 
Conversely, where the air descends, a high pressure zone is formed because of the weight of the air coming in from above. Such zones are known as high pressure zones. These areas are characterized by dryness, which is why all the world's deserts are located here. It's worth noting that even Antarctica is considered a desert, although it is covered in ice and extremely cold. A desert is not defined by the presence of sand, as many people believe, but by the lack of precipitation. Different pressure zones alternate in these areas, creating different climate belts. At the borders of the atmospheric cells where warm air from the south meets cold air from the north, there is a favorable zone for planes to fly. Due to the pressure difference, strong winds blow here from west to east, which are known as high-altitude jet streams. Planes often take advantage of these winds to increase their speed, and a flight from New York to London in 2020 was able to arrive in a record five hours instead of the usual six by riding the tailwind. These atmospheric cells are massive compared to our size. When aircraft reach a height of about 10 kilometers, they reach the upper boundary of the troposphere, which is the first layer of the atmosphere where humans and other living beings reside. The troposphere is often referred to as the changesphere because it is constantly in a state of flux. The reason for the diversity of weather conditions in this layer is due to its high density of air, moisture, and heat, which drive the atmospheric machines that generate weather patterns. Yes, the troposphere is the layer of the atmosphere in which we live and breathe. Above the troposphere are other layers of the atmosphere, and each layer has different characteristics. The reason scientists divide the atmosphere into layers is mainly because of temperature differences. When planes go up, the temperature drops to about minus 4,550 degrees Celsius. Well, the closer you get to space, the colder it must be, right? The temperature in the atmosphere changes in a very complex way. It's as if the atmosphere can't decide whether it wants to cool down or warm up, or cool down again or warm up. Instead, temperature changes fluctuate at different altitudes, creating a layering effect. Scientists have divided the atmosphere into layers based on these temperature variations, and each layer has its own unique characteristics and physical properties. For example, in the troposphere, the temperature drops from plus 10 to minus 45 degrees Celsius, then levels off and begins to rise until it reaches zero degrees Celsius. This is where all storms and cyclones subside, and the atmosphere becomes calm. Everything is quiet, and the stratosphere begins. Stratos, in Greek, means layer, so the stratosphere is essentially a layered sphere. In the stratosphere, the air is stratified, with warm and cold masses lying in separate layers. This layering creates a stable and calm environment, which is why pilots like to fly in the stratosphere. Cruising altitude for airplanes is usually in the lower stratosphere, where there is low air resistance and no turbulence. For the same reason, Kaiser Wilhelm's giant cannon during World War, I launched projectiles as high as 42 kilometers to take advantage of low air resistance in the upper atmosphere. Modern passenger planes usually cruise at around 12 kilometers, because there is no need to go higher for normal flight operations. However, supersonic fighters are designed to fly at much higher altitudes, often above 20 kilometers. At those heights, they can take advantage of the thinner air to travel faster and with less resistance. Take a look at these pictures. The altitude in the pictures is only 17 kilometers, and the sky is completely black. Pilot Alexander Fedotov holds the world record for climbing to an altitude of nearly 38 kilometers on a MiG-25. Only balloon and rocket-powered machines have ever climbed higher. If you want to imagine what it is like in the stratosphere, imagine the surface of Mars, the same dryness, pressure, and exposure to ultraviolet radiation there. As you go higher, the temperature around you will increase, with the air getting warmer with each kilometer. Also, the lack of the ozone layer at higher altitudes means that exposed skin will be exposed to more ultraviolet radiation. Normally, the ozone layer traps harmful ultraviolet rays and warms the air. Here's how the ozone layer works. When ultraviolet rays hit oxygen molecules O2, they break them apart, creating heat. The debris from this reaction comes together to form ozone O3. This third oxygen atom is crucial, as it absorbs harmful ultraviolet radiation incredibly efficiently, sacrificing itself in the process. 
However, the amazing thing is that ozone is incredibly resilient and regenerates itself quickly after absorbing radiation. The process of ozone formation and destruction has been an ongoing cycle for millions of years. However, human intervention has disrupted this natural balance by introducing chemicals into the atmosphere. One example is Freon, a substance used in old refrigerators, which has been released into the stratosphere. When Freon reaches the stratosphere, chlorine atoms break off and react with ozone molecules, stealing an oxygen atom and transforming them into ordinary oxygen. That's how our chemistry began to destroy ozone. Fortunately, there is some good news. After people banned the use of substances such as Freon in refrigerators and other such chemicals, the ozone layer has begun to recover. The most famous hole in the ozone layer above Antarctica, once larger than the continent itself, has already begun to shrink and is predicted to disappear by about 2070. We and other complex organisms are doomed to live far below the ozone layer. It's fascinating to learn that certain types of bacteria use the stratosphere as a highway to travel between continents. They can get up there through volcanic eruptions or violent storms that penetrate the troposphere ceiling. Even though the conditions in the stratosphere are quite similar to those on Mars, these hardy bacteria can survive thanks to their ability to transform into an alternative form known as endospores. Essentially, the bacterium creates a clone of itself and envelops it like a spacesuit. It then pushes out all moisture and seals the DNA like luggage to protect it from the harsh environment. However, humans have found a way to conquer the stratosphere by creating their own version of an endospore. This involves using an airtight cabin called a gondola and a large balloon filled with hydrogen and helium, which is referred to as a stratostat. Interestingly, the stratostat was invented by Auguste Picard, who also built the first bathyscape. Initially, Picard created the stratostat to seal the cabin's interior pressure at human safe levels. He then improved his invention to withstand the enormous pressure found at the bottom of the ocean. Picard did not shy away from testing his inventions himself and succeeded in conquering two hazardous elements, the bottom of the ocean and the stratosphere. And 80 years later, Felix Baumgartner, an extreme mountaineer, reached an altitude of 39 kilometers in the stratosphere and then jumped, accelerating to supersonic speed before deploying his parachute. However, his record was surpassed by Alan Eustace, the head of Google, who used a specially designed spacesuit and a helium-filled balloon to reach an altitude of 41.4 kilometers. However, there is a limit to how high balloons can reach. Even if a balloon is large enough to be pushed upward by discharged air, it will eventually expand on ascent until it bursts. As a result, no balloon has ever flown above 53 kilometers. However, there is a recent observation of a peculiar phenomenon in the stratosphere that is yet to be explained. This anomaly appears as if a large gas burner has been ignited in the sky leaving scientists to wonder about its cause and nature. Examining more closely, we can observe that thunderclouds give rise to electric discharges that extend for dozens of kilometers. Interestingly, these discharges, known as blue jets, do not move downwards towards the ground, but rather upwards towards space. The most enormous blue jets can stretch up to 70 kilometers. Nature strives for uniformity and balance, so it seeks to eliminate clusters of positive and negative charges at any cost. This results in lightning strikes, which may appear to us as if they move downwards, but in reality, always begin with two opposing micro-discharges. The positively charged particles move towards the negatively charged particles, and vice versa, until they come together. This is the most common form of lightning that occurs between the Earth and the sky. The micro-discharges eventually merge to form a bridge, acting as a conductor. The largest and most significant discharge, which originates from the ground, flows through this bridge. It neutralizes all the positive and negative charges present in the clouds and on the ground. This discharge is what we see and hear as thunder. Interestingly, it's important to note that the primary discharge doesn't move from the top of the cloud to the ground, as was once believed, but rather from the ground up. The lightning discharge seems to be striking back at the cloud, repeatedly, until the ground and the cloud become evenly charged. However, there are still positive charges present at the top of the cloud that need to be eliminated. These charges move upwards and collide with negative particles dozens of kilometers above the ground, resulting in a blue jet. 
However, there are many other interesting facts about lightning that have been discovered. For instance, scientists have found a family of lightning bolts that are much higher than blue jets. This layer of lightning is visible in an image taken by the Space Shuttle Endeavour, which depicts the blue mesosphere situated between the orange troposphere and white stratosphere. The mesosphere is the middle layer of the atmosphere, hence its name. The mesosphere is the coldest place on Earth, where temperatures can drop to minus 100 degrees Celsius. Unlike the lower layers of the atmosphere, which contain an ozone layer that absorbs ultraviolet radiation and warms the air, the mesosphere does not contain enough particles to absorb energy from space and retain heat from below. It's like wearing a tank top in the winter. Even lightning discharges in the mesosphere are cold. Sprites are a type of lightning phenomena that resemble octopuses or alien walkers from War of the Worlds. They appear in groups and can grow up to 50 kilometers in height and the same width, unlike ordinary lightning, which can heat the air to 25,000 degrees Celsius. Sprites are no hotter than a normal lamp. In fact, if you have ever touched a lamp, you may have noticed that it does not burn you. Sprites are composed of cold plasma, similar to the plasma inside a lamp. This is because the hot particles in a sprite are diluted with cold gas, resulting in only a slight increase in temperature. Sprites are a type of giant cold discharge that occurs in the mesosphere at an altitude of 50 kilometers or more. Interestingly, sprites do not appear independently, but instead occur at the same time as lightning discharges inside the cloud, helping to balance electrical charges throughout the atmosphere. The lightning that we see is only a small part of a vast network of discharges that extend hundreds of kilometers upward into the atmosphere. While we may not notice them due to cloud cover, different layers of the atmosphere regularly exchange discharges. In addition to sprites and jets, there are other types of discharges that are often overlooked, such as elves. Elves are shockwaves that propagate through a thunderstorm in the form of a ring. There's also a green aura, known as ghost, that has been observed in the vicinity of these discharges. There are other creatures besides lightning that have been given names such as pixies, which were named after English fairies, and troll, which hold sprites on them. However, our understanding of these mythical creatures is limited. Our knowledge of lightning creatures has only recently begun to develop due to advancements in high-speed photography and images from space. Some of these creatures have only been studied for the past 150 years because they have appeared over our cities. And these are clouds of ice and space dust. They are called silvery clouds. They appear in the sky after sunset, when all other clouds disappear. You can see them because they glow brightly, even in the evening. The height of these clouds is about 80 kilometers, while ordinary clouds fly at a height of only a few kilometers. The formation of silver clouds requires the simultaneous presence of three certain conditions extreme cold of about minus 130 degrees Celsius, a significant amount of water vapor where it is not normally present, and the presence of space dust. Such a set of conditions is quite rare. Silver clouds were first observed after the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano in 1883 and the fall of the Tunguska meteorite in 1908. These events released large amounts of dust and water vapor into the atmosphere, causing ice clusters to form around the dust particles and create silvery clouds. Although rare, at first, these clouds have become increasingly common over time, and some scientists believe that human activity is partly responsible, so these clouds may be a warning of an impending climate crisis. Despite the exciting activity occurring in the mesosphere, humans cannot directly observe it because the air in this layer is too thin for airplanes and balloons to fly, but too dense for orbiting satellites. Satellites can burn up or get damaged, because of the intense friction generated in this region. As a result, our ability to study this layer of the atmosphere is limited. However, there is a way to explore this layer of the atmosphere using suborbital flights. Instead of launching a spacecraft into orbit, this type of plane was first used by the Americans in 1959 with the launch of the X-15, which was flown by Neil Armstrong long before his famous trip to the moon. Richard Branson's Unity spaceship uses a similar concept to the Cosmoplane, where a booster plane takes the space plane into the stratosphere, and then the space plane uses its rocket engine to reach the mesosphere. So far, Unity's record altitude is 90 kilometers. However, 
Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, chose a more traditional approach for his space company. He built a rocket using conventional methods. The rocket uses hydrogen as a fuel source. The top of the rocket, which contains the passengers, reached a height of 107 kilometers. There is nothing particularly innovative about it. Bezos reached the same height that the German FAO, which used similar principles, reached 80 years before him. With their help, the Americans were able to take the first picture of the Earth from space and from the same height to which Bezos ascended. The video shows a test flight with a dummy, and there is an eerie silence in the mesosphere, with only the humming of mechanisms being heard. Despite the rocket's high speed, the wind is inaudible. The upper layers of the mesosphere have very few gas particles, which explains the silence. However, entering the lower and denser layers of the atmosphere creates a terrifying sound. Bezos reached a height of 107 kilometers, seven kilometers above the Kármán line, which is widely considered to be the boundary of space. However, this is not entirely accurate. The Kármán line, located at 100 kilometers above sea level, marks the boundary between two fundamentally distinct methods of flying. The zone up to 100 kilometers is designated for airplanes and balloons as they rely on airlift to fly. The zone above 100 kilometers is reserved for orbiters, satellites, and rockets. NASA typically consider the boundary of space to be around 80 kilometers, precisely 50 miles. However, this is subject to rounding, and there is no universally accepted legal definition of where Earth ends and space begins. So Branson and Bezos engage in an endless competition on Twitter, comparing their spacecraft. However, neither of them were honored as astronauts because they did not fly the ship or ensure the safety of the flight. Either the crew or the automatic systems ran everything instead. That's it. You build your space empire and get no astronaut badge. We will be going even higher to explore the next layer of the atmosphere. At around 90 kilometers altitude, the thermosphere starts, where there is no sound as it takes a molecule of air one kilometer to collide with another molecule. This means that even if you were to scream, no one could hear you. As we ascend higher, there is less and less air present in the atmosphere. As you ascend higher into the thermosphere, the temperature of the air surrounding you begins to increase with every kilometer. This may seem strange, given that you are essentially in space where there is no atmosphere to heat up. The reason for this is that the thermosphere acts as a shield that protects our planet from the harmful effects of ultraviolet and X-ray radiation, which are even more potent than ordinary ultraviolet light. They all hit air particles and accelerate them to enormous speeds. This is the temperature. So, the Chinese lost control of the Tiangong station. The Tiangong station lost control and collapsed out of orbit within two years. This was due to tiny particles that were 16 kilometers apart, hitting the 10-meter station and slowing it down, similar to concrete bumpers on a roadside. Footage shows the station already in the lower layers when this occurred. The International Space Station must accelerate periodically to remain in orbit. When this happens, the astronauts lose their weightlessness and objects begin to move with a slight acceleration. But that's it. You have already reached the International Space Station. You fly 16 kilometers and meet just one particle. What else can be found here? It would seem, wouldn't it? As it turns out, the military also utilizes this layer as a giant mirror for their radars. Short radio waves are unable to travel directly from antenna to antenna across continents, but they can be mirrored by ions and electrons, which are most abundant in the thermosphere. The military takes advantage of this clever technique for their radars, planes, and ships. The military relies on the thermosphere as a giant mirror to transmit signals across the horizon. Without it, their communication would be impossible Above 600 kilometers is a prison for the sun's most dangerous and highly charged particles, which are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. Exosphere serves as a genuine portal connecting Earth and space, where even the tiniest remnants of our world dissipate into the vastness. Here, a particle can journey a thousand kilometers without encountering another. Some particles traverse at such remarkable speeds that they attain the second cosmic velocity, reaching 11 kilometers per second, enabling them to break free from Earth's gravitational pull. Yuri Gagarin is widely known as the first person to leave the planet in 1961. But let me remind you, Yuri Gagarin crossed the Kármán line, 
and this is a conditional boundary. The atmosphere then continues and above. Moreover, individual hydrogen and helium particles also fly in the exosphere. So, when a cloud of these particles reflects ultraviolet light from the sun, a glow appears. We call it the geocorona, which extends up to 630,000 kilometers from Earth. This means that technically, even the moon is within the Earth's atmosphere. So, the Apollo crews who walked on the lunar surface were technically still on Earth. Were it not for the pressure, an astronaut could have removed his helmet and inhaled the hydrogen and helium of his native Texas while on the moon. However, in the language of physics, no one has yet left our planet. The first people to actually leave our planet will be those who go to Mars. This is yet another reason to send an expedition there. By studying the atmosphere down to its atoms, we have also discovered that our Earth is larger than we previously thought. It's amazing, and as usual, pump your brains. Bye.